Okay, welcome uh, everyone to this uh, afternoon session, at least uh, Berlin time zone. Uh, because we had technical difficulties with the first speaker who resides in China, which uh, has the firewall, uh, we'll play a recording of that uh, of the talk, the scheduled talk, which means that there will not be a question and answer session as uh, would normally be the case. Uh, this will be held on Northstar at a later date. After uh, the first talk, we'll go on with the rest of the schedule that will have uh, Q&A sessions. Um, a couple of uh, remarks. One is that uh, the session will be recorded. Um, so if you're in it, you will be recorded. Uh, you can ask questions for the second talk. Um, and you can do that uh, via the question part, or you can do that um, uh, via the chat, which way, uh, which case will convert it to a question. It's preferable that you write them so I can read them out since this will uh, save time uh, in switching between persons. Okay, so now we'll start uh, the presentation of um, Xiaolao Zhang, uh, who normally resides at the Monash Biomedical Imag Imaging uh, Department at Monash University. And the title of her presentation is Delineating Reward Avoidance Decision Process in the impulsive compulsive spectrum disorders through a probabilistic reversal learning task. So let's go ahead and start the recording. Um, I don't hear any sound. Initiating reward and avoidance learning obsessive compulsive spectrum disorders. For today's presentation, I'll give a um, I'll give a introduction, background introduction, including value based decision making in part. University and uh, today I will give a, give a presentation of my PhD work, Initiating Reward Avoidance Learning Obsessive Compulsive Spectrum Disorders. For today's presentation, I'll give a um, I'll give a introduction, background introduction, including value-based decision making, impulsivity and compulsive constructs, and my experiment design goal. And then I will give a detailed introduction of my eight research aims from behavioral and imaging and the clinical level. And finally, a research summary. In order to be a healthy lifestyle, your mom just went for your afternoon snacks, apple and chips. And if you choose the apple, you could play one video games. And if you choose the chip, you have to do, you have one more out to do your homework. Under this, this segment senses, what's your, what's your choices? Choose the apple for game, for a while video game rewarding or chips for homework punishment. Um, like this, just like this lecture, we have a lot of decisions every day, simple decisions like uh, what or we should eat or drink for lunch or complex decisions like whether we should go for a PG study. Actually, decision making is a multidimensional process which involves three stages. The first one is value estimation. You're going to assign values to available options and second, the choice selection. You are choosing the preference um, among the alternatives. And finally, it's learning from the outcome to update a future decision-making process. The question fundamental decision-making is how to acquire the preferable one from alternative options. And second is how to learn from this previous experience. Reinforcement learning theory is a computational account of the decision-making process. According to the reinforcement learning, the preference is acquired according to the expected value of action, and the previous experience is utilized to learn, thus improving the outcome of future choices. The typical reinforcement learning task from team study is designed to investigate the reward avoidance based decision process. The task consists of reward, avoidance, and neutral condition. And 
In each condition, there will be a uh, there will be a, a, a pair of fractal to display to let the participant choose, and one fractal will have high probability to get remote to reward or loss, and another will have no probability. And this probability difference is to um, is to let the participants know which one has a high probability to get a reward and try to win as much money or avoiding losing money. I will later give a detailed in, detailed introduction of this task. A barren reward avoidance processing decision process has also exist in the clinical conditions. Gambling disorder, which has a, a prevalence of um, uh, 0, 0, um, 0.5 to 1 percent of among population, and is char characterized by as an impulsive disorder, which is already known has a barren reward processing with underestimation of gambling harm, while also can Obsessive compulsive disorder, which has a um, almost a three percent prevalence among the population, and which is a characterized by as a compulsive disorder, which is known has the risk avoidance with overestimation of possible possible harm. Um, the OCD, the GDI OCD among along the dimensional model of the obsessive compulsive spectrum disorder and the impulsivity and the compulsivity represent polar opposite psychiatric spectrum, spectrum constructs. Um, while recent studies has found uh, with the increase of the impulsivity in gambling disorder patients, there exists a compulsive feature with more punishment sensitivity. While, um, while while the increase of the compulsive team in OCD patients, there will be impulsive feature um, with more apparent rewarding symptoms. Based on the previous learning task, we design a level reward and avoidance learning task to investigate the decision making process in both gambling disorder and OCD patients, as well as the impulsive team and compulsive constructs. Um, our studies derive from the King's one. Um, this is a reversal reward, but we have a, um, this is our reversal reward avoidance learning task, the same. Our task has three conditions, reward, avoidance, and neutral. And under each, and those three conditions are randomized, are completely uh, displayed in a completely randomized way. Under each condition, there will be a specific pair of fractals. One will have high probability to get a reward, um, under the reward condition, a low probability to get a punishment under avoidance condition, while the, which also refers to the quick one, while the other is vice versa. Participants are displayed a fractal pair for 2,000 seconds to make the choice, and once the fractal was chosen, it will be highlighted after for 35 miles, 3,500 miles seconds, and then once the fractal was chosen, um, and the outcome under reward condition would be getting one point as a reward or fixed cross as no reward. The outcome under avoidance condition could be losing one point as punishment, punishment or fixed cross as successful avoiding punishment. Especially, there is a probability switch uh, feature in the middle of the task, which the quick choice will be changed to the incorrect one and vice versa. The reason why we decide the uh, reverse is to generate participants for the learning of the task and enhance learning signals such as prediction error. I will introduce you later. At the same time, with task is learning, participants were also under FMI scanning, here 42 healthy controls, 40 OCD and 23 gambling disorder patients are recruiting for the project. Um, using the learning task and combination with the new imaging technique, our research aims are split into three levels. And behavior level, we are going to understand the participant's reward and what is learning in the healthy control group, and um, including uh, which is from the statistical analysis of participants' quick choice, response time, the learning curve, and critically modeling to investigate the participant's computational process to perform the task. Also, um, the modeling is then used to do model-based FM analysis linking the behavior to the brain activation. At image level is investigate brain activation map involved with reward and avoidance learning in a healthy control group. Then the behavioral analysis as, uh, as well as the modeling um, and imaging regression will be applied to the clinical group 
to study the behavioral brain activation differences of reward and voice learning in OCD and GD, and also um, the impulsivity and compulsivity constructs effects on learning performance um, through the clinical symptom. Um, at a behavior level, I will present findings during my first year, um, um, during findings, including participants' group choice, response time, and learning curve, and then the second year, uh, modeling fit into the behavior data. Um, firstly, we look into the number of correct anchor choices and the reward, avoidance, and neutral condition. It was found that participants favor the correct choices both under the reward and avoidance condition. And further, we look into the response time and participants may significantly quicker response under the uh, to the re risk uh, reward condition as no response time under avoidance condition compared to the uh, neutral ones. Further, we separated into the, the trials into eight, blo eight, eight blocks to build a learning curve of participants' uh, performance during the task. Each block, we compare the uh, uh, compare the number of quick and quick choices. The arrow, the arrow here is the probably which happened. You could say the participant significantly quick the quick choice before and after the problem switch. Also, uh, we found the participants prefer the quick choices under the avoidance condition. Um, this behavior findings show that healthy control group did know the task well. How will the computational process under those learning? In order to answer this question, we fitted a model to the participant behavior data. Um, the Q-learning one is is the is kind of standard uh, model used in such learning task, uh, which consists of three components. And firstly, the action value component will update the expectation values and equals the expectation value last trial added by the learning rate multiplied by the prediction error. Then the error calculation will go to calculate the error prediction error, which is a discrepancy between participants' expectation uh, expectation of the choices and actual outcome. While the following the action se action selection component, we use a soft we, we use a soft max rule to calculate the um, um, the action selection probability. Here, the parameter here is the learning rate, which is a uh, which is scale from zero to one, uh, which could show um, the, how quickly the participants update uh, their choices during the task. And the beta here is the inverse temperature parameter, which is the balance of participants' exploration and exploitation. And it is a scale from zero to 20. And uh, then the model estimation uh, is to, sorry, um, actually, um, for each uh, for each participant, we were going to estimate a specific period of alpha and beta, and we could calculate a time series of uh, expected value and prediction error. Further, those time series are going to be referred to our functional neural imaging data, and thus we could look, look into the brain map listing under this computational process. Model estimation is calculated the alpha and beta and a good estimation is very important. The original one I use, I use is the lective log likelihood. It calculates the sum of the uh, lective log likelihood of all participants' action selection probability and then find out alpha and beta to make the sum minimize. Alpha and beta was a uh, linear searching from certain ranges, so it is quite limited and not so efficiently. Next, I try to improve the estimation through my lab FMI function, this function could work both linearly and non-linearly and make the search range and grow broadly to three dimensions. But both of these methods um, had these boundary values. And in order to um, solve it with this, um, um, we, um, that the Bayesian modeling was suggested. Um, here, it is supposed that each participant's behavior data follows a uh, a certain distribution and then all of this distribution was shrink, was shrink to a group distribution. Not only consider each uh, individual parameter value, but also follows uh, group characteristics. Application of the Bayesian estimation could well solve the um, boundary uh, values. Um, then the model estimation is down to test how good the, our model fits to the task, how we're going to do that. We use the model and estimated parameter to run the task. The trial by trial quick choice 
of power will be generated by the computer. And we compare the, here is our, here is the participant's actual, um, actual choices. We compare with our simulated data, no significant differences were found. And we show that um, the pure learning model could well, um, could well fit in our um, learning task. Through the model estimation, we found that the healthy control group had a higher learning rate under the voidless condition compared to the reward condition, which means that participants update quickly under voidless condition compared to the reward condition. While the reward condition showed a higher learning rate, a higher temperature parameter compared to the voidless condition, which means that participants, um, our participants are more likely to exploit if they get it, if they get it reward. Um, actually, um, I'll give a further review of the behavior performance. Here is the participant behavior performance in the King study, and there is our, the participant performance in our study. You could say that um, using this learning task, we found that the healthy controls in both learning tasks prefer the correct choices under the reward and avoidance condition, um, which means that participants um, they learn the task and make the quick choice. While uh, participants were also found to show higher, quicker response under the reward condition while slower response under the voidance condition. Then the next um, we use uh, at imaging, at image level, we are combining, we are combining with the modeling, the fMRI data to improve, we have investigate the brain activation map involved with this reward and avoidance learning in the healthy control group. Before combination with the neural imaging, the fMRI data to be processed. Here we use the standard uh, pre-processing state. The functional fMRI first as slice time into the, uh, to the middle slice of each volume and then the special realignment for movement artifacts. The T1 imaging will courageous to the um, standard to to the mean API generated during the alignment, and then the structure was normalized to the uh, uh, MR space using the six tissue covering map. This deformation fields were applied to the functional um, functional neural imaging data for normalization, and finally a uh, uh, eight mile second mile meter uh, mile meter um, Gaussian kernel for smooth. Here, uh, firstly, we separated our our trials into uh, rewarded trials and the long missing um, missing rewarded trials, the punished trials, and also the successful avoidance trials, and then a contrast of rewarded plus um, uh, punished and missing minus punished added by a missing reward was to uh, to to test the, the associated neural correlates. And here we found that um, the medial FC. PCC and striatin should increase activity uh, as um, after obtaining reward as well as success rewarding adversive outcome. Meanwhile, the SMA and right insular should higher activation after punishment as well as non-rewarding outcome. While in King study, it was found that the medial FC should act, should increase activity after obtaining reward as well as um, avoiding punishment. Then the time, this is the time series genera uh, generated from the model under the reward and um, avoidance condition. After we go through the neural imaging data, we found that um, the brain region, including the left uh, superior medial frontal, right hippocampus, and binatural cingulum should, um, should um, correlate with the reward expected value. Um, well, uh, for the avoid expected value, we found that a binatural insula and right dorsal striatum and right superior medial frontal were correlated with the uh, avoid, avoid, avoidance expectation value. Um, here, the, the brain activation at the medial FC and the medial, uh, medial frontal region was also found in um, Kim's study. Um, here is the time series of 
our printing share law, which is also generated from derived from our model and uh, after reverse flow functional neuroimaging data, we found that um, the reward predict share law was positively associated with the brain, uh, with the cortical, subcortical brain regions, including the, the striatum, binatural insula, as well the whole singular. Well, um, in study, the a reward predict share role was found highly associated with the uh, ventral striatum, which is also a, a dopamine target, targeted brain region. Um, under avoidance condition, the aversive predict share was found associated with the brain activation at the bilateral insula and the dorsal striatum, as well as the thalamus, which is also the bilateral insula activation has been reported in Kim study. Um, I'll give a summary of image findings and uh, at outcome stage, we found that the medial FC, PCC and striatum should increase activity of after obtaining reward as well as success avoidance of versus outcome. Meanwhile, SMA and light issuer should higher activation after punished as well as non rewarding outcome. While for the expected value, the reward expectation value was found a positive associated with the regions, including superior medial frontal, right anterior cingulate, or, and also the brain region, including um, the uh, middle cingulum. While the avoid, avoidance expectation value was found negatively associated with the brain region, including the uh, inferior orbital frontal cortex, right insula, and right superior frontal, including the right middle cingulum and right ACC. For the reward pre prediction role, the reward prediction role was found positive associated with the activity in the brain region, including the um, right fusiform, including the striatum, cingulate, financial insula, as well as the thalamus. While the versus prediction role was associated, at, associated with brain activities at thalamus and left uh, insula, while also the bilateral dorsal striatum. While the medial FC and sugar medial a superior medial frontal, inferior orbital frontal cortex, the stratum, as well as the left insula, has also been reporting in the King's uh, research, King's learning task without reversal. So here, compared to King's one, um, here our reversal learning task uh, helps find uh, a larger, a larger brain correlates associated with the uh, different stages of this reward and avoidance based decision process. And then at the clinical level, we are going to compare, we are going to study the behavioral and brain activation differences of reward, of, um, reward avoidance decision in OCD and gambling disorder patients. And here at, for the behavioral performance, we found that uh, the OCD group should have significant preference of the correct choices both under the reward and avoidance condition while the only significant differences was found in gambling disorder patients under avoidance condition. Um, the same um, for the response type, all three group participants should have quicker response under the reward condition as no response under the avoidance condition. Um, the learning curve showed that um, the OCD and gambling dis disorder patients make the quick choices before the problem switch but after the problem switch, they feel the feel the learning and they stick to the um, feel the learning and uh, prefer the in quick choices. Um, still stick to the quick choices before the problem switch. But three groups participants will found that choose the quick choices both before and after the problem switch. And uh, the same way apply the learning model and to do the estimation of the learning um, uh, learning characteristics, including learning weight and temperature parameter. First, under the reward condition, here we found that the healthy control group should a higher learn, significantly higher learning rate compared to other two groups, while the OCD group should a higher temperature parameter compared to other two groups. For the avoidance, can avoid, avoidance condition, participants will found a higher temperature parameter under, avoid, under gambling disorder patients, while um, the OCD participants should a higher temperature parameter under avoidance condition. While compared with compare these two conditions, we found a higher learning rate under avoidance condition compared to the reward condition, while a higher 
temperature parameter under a reward condition compared to the avoidance condition. Um, for them, we compare the when we found the burn regional differences of this um, of these three distinct this three distinct stages of reward and avoidance decision making process at outcome at the outcome stage. Here, the OSV and the gambling disorder both um, clinical groups should decrease activities at uh, decrease brain activities. Here, OSV should de decrease activities or at the right dorsal stratum. Right thalamus, inferior frontal and superior frontal, and outcome of getting reward. While the gambling disorder patients should uh, increase activity at the post central, pre central, and outcome of getting reward. And for the expected right value, the OC patients should uh, increase expectation value at the at, um, avoidance expected value at the anterior singular compared to healthy controls. While for the gambling disorder, it is shown that the gambling patients should uh, increase activation at the inferior frontal um, of, of the aversive prediction error signal, of the aversive prediction error. I'll give a summary, summary of the clinical findings. So uh, for the behavior performance in the learning task, uh, all three patients were found uh, should a significant preference to the quick choices both under reward condition while the gambling disorder find a maladaptive um, uh, learning under avoidance condition um, under reward condition while significant differences under avoidance condition while both OCD and gambling disorder patients should a quicker a significantly quicker response under reward condition while slower response under avoidance condition Learning curve showed that OC and GD had maladaptive learning performance after the problem switch under reward condition. While for the brain regional differences at outcome stage, OC patients should decrease activities at the bilateral um, opercular part of the inferior frontal and the right thalamus at outcome of getting reward. And also the gambling disorder patients should decrease activity at the right post central. For the expected value, OC patients should increase activities at left and to singular at expected value under avoidance condition. And also, the gambling disorder patients should increase activities at the brain region, peak at a right triangular part of the inferior frontal aversive prediction error signal. And finally, um, I would like, um, actually, this work. Um, I would like to show a great acknowledgement to my supervision team and with their help so I can carry my, um, I can um, um, work on this project smoothly and uh, also thank you for my uh, the lab, thank you for our lab member, BMS, BMS Research Hub for their, all the, for all the people for their help as well um, um, the, and the, as also the Brim Park, also the platform of Brim Park, and uh, question welcome. And thank you so much for attending this session. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, thanks, uh, Chao Liu Zhang. She cannot hear me, uh, but she is available on uh, Neurostars uh, if you have questions about this uh, presentation. Um, I don't think it is useful to um, do it here now so to have questions asked here send them to neurostars and then watch the answer but please uh, if you have questions uh, do them uh, uh, ask them on neurostars.org the link is uh, in the chat window so you can just click on it and you end up at uh, the neurostars website um, the next talk will be in about uh, five six minutes so I suggest that uh, we wait five, six minutes until I start that talk um, and uh, take a break. Indeed, coffee break. <laughs> and uh, if... Um, Rafael can just uh, put something on the chat window, then I see you faster than uh, uh, having to f look it up on the list of active people. Ah, here you are.
we'll wait five minutes. <laughs> yes. So can I uh, prepare my screen? Uh, sure. Rafael, there's still a, um, um, a menu on the screen. Oh, that you should uh, press on hide. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, there's a question from Dieter Jaeger about whether uh, you need to log into Neurostar. I registered. And uh, then I get a button where you can reply. Okay, on my computer, it's about uh, one forty. so I'll uh, start the introduction. So it's a pleasure to welcome Rafal Bogac um, uh, to give a presentation. He is currently associated with the Brain Network Dynamics Unit at the University of Oxford. Um, and his talk is entitled Dopamine Role in Learning and Action Inference. And I give the floor to him. So the talk is 15 minutes, and then there will be five minutes for uh, question and answer se uh, session that will be done via the chat or by pushing the ask a question button that you can see uh, sort of middle uh, in the middle bottom of your screen. Okay, go ahead, 
That's all. Okay, excellent. So um, during this um, talk, I would like to uh, introduce a framework for modeling dopamine function. And this framework um, captures role of dopamine both in learning about rewards and in planning actions to get the rewards. So I will start with a brief um, review of dopamine function. And then I will give an overview of the framework, describe details of the model, and discuss its relationship with experimental data. So as we have heard already a few times during this conference, uh, the classical reinforcement learning theory uh, proposes that dopamine encodes reward prediction error. It is uh, typically denoted by delta and defined as a difference between reward and expected reward. Um, and this theory has been proposed on the basis of observation that many dopaminergic neurons respond to unexpected reward. Uh, but when an animal is trained that the conditioned stimulus predicts a reward, uh, the dopaminergic neurons no longer respond to the reward. But then they respond when the monkey is pleasantly surprised by the stimulus predicting the reward. And according to the classical reinforcement learning theory, this prediction error triggers learning about reward expect of the reward expectation. And indeed, it has been observed that uh, dopamine modulates synaptic plasticity in the striatum. However, this classical reinforcement learning theory does not capture the important role of dopamine in action planning. And this role is evident from the difficulties in planning uh, movements uh, seen after the death of dopaminergic neurons in Parkinson's disease. Uh, the role of dopamine in um, movements uh, and action initiation is also consistent with responses of many dopaminergic neurons to movements. And the function of uh, dopamine in energizing movements comes from the fact that it increases excitability of key neurons in the stratum. So during this talk, I would like to uh, propose a modeling framework which extends classical reinforcement learning to describe the role of dopamine in action to which I refer as dopact. So let me um, give an overview of the key elements of this framework. So the first component is a valuation system. And the valuation system computes the value V of reward that animal should acquire in a given situation. And this desired reward V depends on both the reward available in the current state of the environment, as well as the reserves of the animal, such as food and water. So for example, if animal is not hungry, uh, this desired value is equal to zero, even if reward is available. The second component is an actor. And the aim of the actor is to select an action to get the reward set by the valuation system. And during this talk, I would like to focus on describing the actor. So for simplicity, I will assume that the valuation system is able to compute this uh, desired reward V, but I will not describe how this computation is performed. So the actor selects actions through inference in a probabilistic model. And, uh, it describes the relationship between state, which I denote by S, action A, and reward R. And following classical reinforcement learning, I will use capital R to denote the total reward, which includes both in, uh, reward obtained and reward um, in the future. Um, and in the DOPAC framework, two different systems learn different relationship between the variables. Um, the system shown in orange learns how the reward depends on the action in a given state. And I refer to this as goal-directed system because it can infer the action required to get a particular reward. The second system shown in blue learns which action should be generally selected in a given state and I refer to it as a habit system because it suggests actions without considering reward available. So let me illustrate how these different systems contribute uh, to action selection during a typical task. Um, so 
on initial trials, the valuation system uh, evaluates the current state S and computes the desired reward V, and then the goal-directed system finds the action A. And over the trials, the habit system learns to mimic the choices made by the goal-directed system, and then both systems suggest actions and their influence is dependent on their level of certainty. So as I will explain later, the inference um, in the learned probabilistic model can be implemented in a network bearing striking resemblance to the anatomy of the reward circuit. So I propose that different systems can be mapped on the spectrum of cortico-basal ganglia loops. And these loops communicate through a spiral structure of connections identified by Haber and colleagues, which I redraw here in a simplified form. So in this diagram, arrows denote excitatory connections and lines ending with circles denote inhibitory connections. So um, different uh, probability distributions are represented in the corticostratal connections of the corresponding loops. And different populations of dopaminergic neurons encode errors in predictions made by their corresponding systems. So since both valuation and the goal-directed system um, try to predict the reward, these prediction errors describe the difference between the reward and the expectation. By contrast, the habit system just tries to predict an action uh, for a given stimulus. So its prediction error corresponds to a difference between the chosen action and the habitual response to the stimulus. And these dopaminergic neurons trigger plasticity um, of the corticostratal connections. So for example, if an action is uh, selected mostly by a goal-directed system, the resulting prediction error in the habit system will trigger the plasticity in the habit system so it learns to predict the action in the future. And in this way, the habit system can learn to mimic the goal-directed system. During action planning, um, once the valuation system computes the uh, available reward V, it sends it to the dopaminergic neurons in the goal-directed system. In the goal-directed system, the dopaminergic neurons are also involved in action planning. And let me give an overview how this role arises. So um, the reward prediction error is defined as the difference between the reward, which includes the obtained and available re reward, and the expectation. But in the goal-directed system, the expectation is computed on the basis of the current action plan. So it only arises from forming plan to achieve the reward. Therefore, finding an action that can get reward corresponds to reducing this prediction error to zero. So to give an intuition how this goal-directed system operates, let us consider an example of an animal in a standard operant conditioning experiment. Um, so consider a rat which has been trained that pressing a lever results in food delivery. And imagine that a lever is presented to the animal. Its sight will trigger the reward prediction error in the goal-directed system because uh, the, the system received information from the valuation system that the reward is available, but initially it, hadn't, it hasn't predicted any actions, so it doesn't expect any rewards from its action. And this prediction error triggers the process of action planning. And once the action plan is formulated, the expectation is formed and the reward prediction error can decrease. So importantly, the dopamine provides a crucial feedback on whether the current motor plan can give the available reward. And it facilitates action planning until the correct uh, action is found. So let me now describe a model um, for a task in which um, intensity of a single action has to be identified. And such uh, selection of action intensity has often um, be done by animals in the wild. For example, a monkey has to decide how strongly to hit a nut with a stone. 
So let us denote action intensity by A and assume that the animal selects it on the basis of the reward it expects R and the stimulus size S. Um, so let me describe the model um, by going through Mars levels of description and let us start with a computational level. Um, so during action planning, when an animal notices reward available, it chooses an action which maximizes the probability of action given the reward available. And according to Bayes' theorem, this posterior probability is proportional to the product of the likelihood of the reward given action, which I would like to propose is encoded in the goal-directed system, and the prior, which I propose, is encoded in the habit system. And then once um, a reward is obtained, the parameters need to be updated so the animal is not surprised by this reward in the future. This posterior probability could be computed by, from Bayes' theorem, but please note that the action doesn't occur in the denominator. So instead of finding an action which maximizes the posterior, we can find the action which maximizes the numerator of Bayes' theorem. So we um, define an objective function equal to the logarithm of this numerator. And the algorithm uh, employed by the model involve, involves maximization of this objective function f. So during action planning, the action intensity is changed proportionally to the gradient of the objective function f until it converges to a value which maximizes uh, this uh, function f. And then once the reward is obtained, the parameters are modified um, to uh, according to the gradient of f. So to make this algorithm more concrete, let us um, um, give um, the form of this probability distribution. So for the habit system, we assume that the action intensity is normally distributed um, with a mean proportional to stimulus size uh, scaled by parameter h. So the, the larger the nut, the stronger uh, the monkey has to hit it with a stone. By contrast, for the goal-directed system, let's assume that the mean reward is proportional to the product of action intensity stimulus size scaled by parameter q. So this product captures the fact that in many circumstances, the expected reward is proportional to both the stimulus and action intensity. So if the action is too weak, the reward may not be obtained. So for such probability distribution, this objective uh, function just involves two terms, which are the squared prediction errors for the goal-directed and habitual systems. And we can obtain simple expressions for um, update of action intensity and of the parameters. Um, and um, the key elements of this, um, of this algorithm naturally map on the basal ganglia anatomy. Um, so for example, uh, the uh, prediction errors can be computed by um, nodes corresponding to dopaminergic neurons, and they uh, in modulate the excitability in the goal-directed system um, to facilitate action planning and um, trigger the plasticity of the synapses encoding parameters of the model. And um, this model has been simulated in many paradigms, and you can see the details in a paper describing this framework. Um, this uh, framework is consistent with the observed diversity of dopaminergic neurons, as it has been reported that neurons in VTA mostly respond to reward, while in SNC to movements, and also is consistent with the difficulties in voluntary movements of patients with Parkinson's disease. So let me summarize the key um, ideas in this framework. So first, uh, different dopaminergic neurons encode the errors in predictions of their corresponding systems. And these prediction errors trigger learning um, of re about reward and habit formation if the chosen action differs from the habitual response. And secondly, when our brain interacts with the external world, the dopaminergic neurons in the goal-directed system play a role both in learning and action planning. So during learning, they calculate the difference between the reward obtained and the reward expected from taken action. And this predictor, prediction error triggers learning about the expected reward. By contrast, during action planning, um, 
they calculate the difference between the reward available and reward expected from the current action plan, and they facilitate action planning until this difference diminishes. Thank you very much. Great, thanks. Um, perfectly on time. And there are some questions, uh, so I'll ask uh, them in order of votes. Uh, the first question is, could you say a couple of words on how it bridges with Rui Costa's research showing that dopamine is also needed to start voluntary movements? And I'll okay. start. So, so um, in, this, uh, in this framework, um, as I haven't des described the, um, the full details of the, of the mapping, but the um, dopaminergic neurons are only necessary to uh, start the goal-directed movements, but not the habitual movements. So, for example, um, basically, uh, he, uh, to start the volu uh, um, voluntary movement, you need to minimize this prediction error encoded by the dopaminergic neurons, which describes the difference between the reward uh, which is available and the reward which is uh, expected from your current uh, uh, motor plan. So, essentially, um, to um, start the voluntary movements, um, you need to reduce this prediction error, and this prediction error kind of facilitates action planning because it increases the excitability of the neurons in the striatum, which will subsequently uh, uh, increase the activity of the uh, action plan. Uh, by contrast, the, uh, the dopaminergic modulation is not necessary for um, execution of habitual actions, and you know, and this, this is connected with the fact that. Um, for example, in Parkinson's disease, the patients have really problems with goal-directed movements, but not so much uh, with cue-driven movements. And actually, by presenting visual cues, you can help them, uh, for example, with walking. OK, so I'll, I'll go to the next one. Um, do I understand correctly that what you are talking about should be called reinforcement error-based learning? Usually, reinforcement learning is not error-based. Uh, that is, one does not have an explicit function to optimize. Uh, and uh, this is asked by Dmitry Todorov. I should have mentioned that by the pre for the previous question as well. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so there is a key difference um, between uh, the way uh, this framework uh, proposed learning occurs and, this, and the standard way in which um, previously in computational neuroscience, learning in the goal-directed and habit system has been proposed by Nathaniel Dow and colleagues. So uh, in a standard reinforcement learning, the model-free or habit system learns on the base of reward prediction error. Uh, by contrast here, um, I, um, I propose following work of uh, Kevin Miller and his colleagues that the habitual system is not learning on the basis of the reward prediction error, but it's learning on the basis of the um, uh, prediction error, which describes the difference between the chosen action and the habitual action. Yes? Uh, by contrast, the goal-directed system learns on the basis of the reward prediction error. So in, indeed, um, in this model, um, the learning is not only driven by the, uh, directly by the reinforcement, but it's also driven indirectly by this habit prediction error, um, which allows this model to kind of mimic the behavior uh, of the goal-directed system. Okay. Um, there are uh, more questions. Unfortunately, we're almost uh, at the next uh, talk. So um, I don't know what we'll do with these questions, but probably we'll be able to post them somewhere and then uh, maybe on newer stars and they can be answered uh, after that. So thanks again for a very clear and uh, nice talk. And then yes, we Thank you very much. I would be very happy to answer all the questions. So yeah. how do I stop sharing the screen? Uh, I don't know, but I can uh, close your video if you want to Excellent. say goodbye. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> okay, goodbye, thank you. <laughs> okay, so now uh, I'll have to get the next speaker uh, who is Cytred Cy Prado. Uh, can you uh, do something on chat so I can uh, invite you? So otherwise I have to search from amongst 170 people. Here we 
rien. Okay, great. So the next Hello. speaker is can you Sacred. Hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, or at least I can right. hear you. Uh, the next speaker is Sacred Prado. Uh, he works in the Department of Bioengineering at Imperial College uh, London, uh, working with Simon Schultz. And he will talk about neural manifold models for characterizing brain circuit dynamics in neurodegenerative disease. Um, maybe you want to share your screen with your presentation? Okay. Very interesting effect. Sorry. Can you see it? Uh, yeah, but we see the pres uh, presentation view. Can you use the I normal show? How about this? Uh, it's the same. Otherwise, the just same. do it on the, the regular screen that you had before. And then just maximize the slide itself. Um, let me check if I can switch the. Sorry. How about this? Uh, it's still to me. Uh, I see the your slide and the next slide. Oh. How about this? Yeah, now it's good. Yeah, okay. go ahead. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Siegfried, and I'm here to discuss neural manifold models for characterizing brain circuit dynamics in neurodegenerative disease. So neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease are a growing problem for society as they have an increasing impact on healthcare resources, loss of productivity and impact of, on their families and loved ones. And these diseases are irreversible and debilitating conditions that result in progressive degeneration and death of neurons, thereby causing impairments on movement, memory, speech, and other cognitive abilities. The most common type of uh, neurodegenerative disease is dementia, to which 70% of these cases are Alzheimer's disease. And it is projected that there will be a significant increase of such cases in the next decades or so, especially in low-income countries. So the hippocampus, which is the, a critical site for the encoding uh, long-term storage and retrieval of spatial and episodic memories and its connected structures, are among the first areas affected by Alzheimer's disease. And the cells in its CA1 region, called place cells, can be used as a model in understanding how information is represented on single neuron level and how they coordinate in population level for the encoding, consolidation, and retrieval of memories. So, however, although much is known about neural circuits and molecular pathways required for normal hippocampal functions, the processes by which neurodegenerative diseases disable the functioning of the hippocampus and the connected structures remain to be determined. Several studies have used single neuron analysis in understanding the role of the hippocampus. However, previous studies showed that the single neuron activities in higher level air areas involved in cognitive tasks are highly heterogeneous both across neurons and across experimental and behavioral conditions. But emerging advances in imaging technologies, particularly in optical imaging, allows simultaneous recording of a large number of neurons in different structures. However, until now, 
No study has investigated on how a large population of hippocampal cortical cells coordinate together in network level during memory encoding, storage, and retrieval, and how their spatial temporal dynamics are affected by the disease. So in this work, we explore the use of neural manifold data analysis techniques to characterize brain circuit dynamics in neurodegenerative disease. We performed mouse to photon imaging experiments and recorded large scale responses of hippocampal circuits involved in spatial cognition of behaving mice. And for validation, we simulated a model that generates a set of data that mimics the neural activity of hippocampal cells of mouse models running on a circular track while taking into account the effects of the amyloid beta plaques on circuit dynamics. And in both experiments, what we want to do is to perform dimensionality reduction on the recorded and simulated data to learn and uncover intrinsic structures lying in the data. We then performed recurrence analysis on the transformed data to observe how dynamical system properties change over time. We recorded in vivo two photon calcium imaging data from behaving mice. So we used two to 10 month old uh, wild type and transgenic 5X FAD mice, which were injected with HCN1 GCAMP 6S MRuby in the hippocampal subfield CA1. And after seven days, hippocampal window surgery was performed where the cortex above the injection site was aspirated and a glass bottom cannula steel was inserted, replacing the aspirated cortex region. So after a week, the mice underwent behavioral training where they explored a circular chamber floating on an air pressurized table under a two photon resonant mic uh, scanning microscope. And these are the sample videos of the behavioral training for both the circular track and open field experiments. So the imaging sessions were conducted after a week of behavioral training where 512 by 512 pixel images of a region of the CA1 were recorded at a rate of 30 hertz. The mouse position was simultaneously tracked using a magnetic tracker. We then performed more motion correction and ROI segmentation on the calcium imaging data prior to signal extraction. We then used the estimated event trains to construct the place maps that show the spatial preference of the cells as shown in the right figure. So the cells in this place map are ordered according to their spatial preference in the circular track. For the simulation of the activity of hippocampal place cells, uh, we, create, we generated a set of data that mimics the neural activity of a population of hippocampal cells of a mouse running on a circular track as captured in a real two photon calcium imaging experiments. So cells are tuned to fire selectively at a particular location in space with tuned fire, firing rate dropping off according to a von Mises distribution function. And this can be shown in this tuning map. To simulate the mouse trajectory, we assume that the mouse runs with speeds given by an exponential distribution in which the mean is estimated from the mouse experiments. Now, assuming that every cell fires independently according to a Poisson process, we then si simulated spike trains using Poisson count distribution. To simulate the calcium-dependent fluorescent signals measured by the detector of the two-photon mi microscope, we convolve the spike trains with an exponential kernel that captures the statistical properties of calcium flu fluorescent signals. Now, the figure on the right is the color map of the delta F over F of the calcium transient signals of 200 simulated place cells. And uh, below it is the spatial location over time, uh, which is the angular position in the circular track. So um, now we want to also simulate the, the, the effects of amyloid beta plaques on hippocampal circuit dynamics. So as, uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease is caused by the abnormal buildup of amyloid beta and tau proteins around neurons. When amyloid beta proteins clump together, they form plaques that block neuron neuronal, signal uh, neuronal signaling at synapses and eventually destroys the cells. So previous studies showed that amyloid beta plaques that are close to the cells will cause hyperactivity, which means that they will fire almost at any instance of time. And those that are far away from the cells will cause hypoactivity, making them fairly silent. And to take into account these effects, we modified our simulation model by incorporating this hyperactive and hypoactive cells. And then we plan to use this model as reference for the analysis of the data that we are currently recording from our transgenic 5X FAD mouse models of Alzheimer's disease. Now, how do we analyze a highly dimensional neural data. So consider this cell by time activity matrix. Each column of this matrix is what we call the neural state or the neural vector. 
and each of these vectors lies on a highly dimensional space. Now, our goal is to learn a mapping from the data space, which is high dimensional, to a lower dimensional space in which we can better characterize and understand the dynamics of these cells in terms of fewer components. In this particular study and this particular type of data, we use different unsupervised neural manifold learning methods, namely principal component analysis, multidimensional scaling or MDS, and Laplacian eigenmap or LEM. So for principal component analysis, our goal is to identify an ordered set of k or fungal directions that captures the greater, uh, greatest variance in the original set of vectors. So we performed PCA on the simulated data and projected the transformed data onto the first three principal components. So the data points are color-coded according to the spatial position of the mouse on the circular track. So we can also observe that by considering only the first two components, as we can see in the upper left panel, we can fairly decode the spatial position of the mouse. We also performed PCA on the real data. And as we can observe, the points are more scattered in the space, but there is still clustering according to the mouse position, uh, as we can see in the first two components. Next, we used uh, multidimensional scaling. Here, our goal is to find an embedding that preserves pairwise distances or generalized dissimilarities between data points in high dimensional space. So we first compute the cosine distance or the similarity matrix of the original data vectors, then apply centering matrix to this matrix and then perform eigenvalue decomposition. And similar to PCA, the data points are also clustered according to the spatial position of the mouse. And when we look at the, two, the first two dimensions in the upper left panel, we can see a finer and more precise clustering compared to PCA. Now for the real data, there is a more refined clustering when we consider the first two dimensions as well as compared to uh, PCA. Next, for the Laplacian eigenmap, it uses a sparse local neighborhood graph to approximate geodesic distances among data points. And each of the edge of this neighborhood graph is weighted using a Gaussian heat kernel. So again, we did the same for the simulated data and the real data. Now let's uh, compare the performances of the three methods in terms of the dimensionality. So here, uh, we plotted the cumulative fraction of variance in the population activity explained by the manifolds of increasing dimensionality that's on the left figure. And on the right figure, we plotted the intrinsic dimensionality versus the number of cells. Now, here we define intrinsic dimensionality as the minimum number of dimensions that explain at least 80% of the data variance. And as we can see in both figures, MDS outperformed the other two methods with only two dimensions for any number of cells and only two components to, comp to capture more than 90% of the variance. So in general, MDS captures higher variance in less dimensions than the other two uh, methods. We also did the same for the real data. And as we can see, again, MDS uh, performed best among the three. But from the ninth dimension onwards, MDS and LEM almost uh, performed similarly. Now, we also compared uh, the effects. We also observed the effects of amyloid plaques in the uh, manifold space. So this one, as, I, as I've shown earlier, this is for the control uh, model. And this one on the right is uh, the simulated data for the Alzheimer's disease model. And as we can see, uh, uh, the addition of hyperactive and hypoactive cells uh, scattered the data points in the manifold space. But we can still see in the first two components using MDS, we can still decode the spatial position of the mouse precisely. Now, the question is, how can we now quantify the changes of the trajectories on and across the manifolds? So for example, if we have this uh, for the control model and it changes over time during the progression of the disease, how can we now quantify this, the changes in the trajectories on and across the manifolds? So we can use what we call the recurrence analysis, particularly by plotting the recurrence plots. So recurrence analysis is a type of nonlinear data analysis, which is a more powerful tool uh, in characterizing the behavior of a dynamical system in phase space. It is useful when observing how things change over time. So the patterns in the recurrence plot 
depict the characteristics of the system and I will discuss that in the next slides. So here is the comparison of the different data using recurrence analysis. So for the simulated data for the control model, um, we can see uh, diagonal lines, which means which, su which suggests that states uh, are uh, repeating over time or recurring over time. On the real data for the control uh, control model, which is real data, we can observe here uh, in the middle, we can observe the presence of vertical and uh, horizontal lines, which suggests that some states do not change or change slowly for some time. This may be caused by uh, the, the, the fact that it, during the recording, uh, there are instances that the mouse is not moving. So, uh, we can also see some disruptions or white bands, which may also indicate that some states are rare or far from the normal or that the transitions uh, transitions may have occurred. Now, on the rightmost plot here, for the simulated data for Alzheimer's disease model, there are, the, there are bold lines. So, the presence of this bold line suggests that the evolution of states is similar at different epochs but with different velocity and that the dynamics of the systems the system could be uh, changing. So in summary, uh, neural manifold dimensionality reduction models revealed a structure in the reduced dimensional space, both for synthetic and real data. The patterns depict, depicted in the recurrence plots revealed a cyclic pattern of transitions and similarity of evolution of network states that corresponded to different locations over time across trials. And when we consider the effects of amyloid beta plaques on the dynamics of the cells that are near and far away from the cells, causing hyperactivity and hyperactivity uh, respectively, uh, we can see that uh, the structures in the lower dimensional space are disrupted. And we have also shown that uh, the neural manifold and recurrence analysis are useful tools in quantifying how neurodegenerative diseases affect the dynamics of hippocampal circuits. So we can use this uh, analysis techniques in quantifying how the dynamics of hippocampal cells change during the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So uh, I want to acknowledge uh, my colleagues, our principal investigator, Professor Simon Schultz, and uh, Dr. Mary Ngo, our postdoctoral fellow in the lab, and the rest of the Schultz lab uh, for helping me in this uh, study. And Thank you very much for listening. Okay. Thank you. Um, in view of time, we'll go directly to asking the questions. Uh, the first question is again by Dmitry Todorov. Um, and the question is, how did you choose your dimensionality reduction methods over other ones available? For instance, a multi, um, multi-dimensional scaling versus UMAP or TSNU or that kind of other kind um, of um uh we 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 tried to uh to 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 uh to use different models and for this particular talk we just chose the ones that gave the 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 best performance but the best we, performance was based on uh, simulated data on, or experimental for from the simulated data okay, okay. uh then we'll move to the other question, which I think is a more technical question. Uh, are you mm -hmm. applying dim red to DF over F or to deconvolved spikes? So it's whether the, you over add F. the fluorescent it, signal or the spiking signal. The D, uh, we applied uh, the dimensionality reduction to the DF over F, not the spikes. Okay, thanks. And this question was asked by Soledad Gonzalo Cogno. Okay, okay, I think uh, we're running, uh, we ran out of time. Uh, so more right. questions, uh, they can be asked on Neurostars as well. Okay, I and will then, be happy to answer them offline. Great. And then could the next speaker say something on the chat, Anton Chisov? Then I can invite you to the...
Sí. Okay, so the next speaker will be Anton Shisov, who is currently a senior researcher at the, in the Laboratory of Computational Physics at the Joffe Physical Technical Institute. And the title of his presentation is Coupled Experimental and Modeling Representation of the Mechanisms of Epileptic Discharges in Rat Brain Slices. Um, could you share your screen? Yeah. yeah. Do you see my screen? Uh, I see, yeah. Right. And then there's a, a little uh, menu that says uh, about a Crowdcast that should be hidden. No, don't stop sharing. But okay. Hide it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, organizers, for the organization of the conference. Uh, I will talk about uh, epilepsy. Uh, we are studying epilepsy in experiments and with uh, modeling. We do experiments in the uh, Sechenov Institute of Evolutionary Physiology and Biochemistry and modeling in EOFI Physical Technical <coughs> Institute. Of course, uh, in future we want to help uh, patients, uh, but uh, as well, um, uh, epilepsy is a very uh, helpful uh, particular case uh, which helps to improve models, mathematical models of um, <clears throat> uh, cortical tissue functioning. Um, uh, what we see uh, during epilepsy uh, in patient. Uh, before surgery, doctors uh, record uh, electrical activity and in uh, focus of epilepsy, uh, we see this uh, high amplitude discharges. Uh, these uh, discharges, ictal discharge, it can uh, pass to ictal state and uh, typical uh, ictal discharge lasts uh, half of a minute or so. Uh, uh, Interictal or preictal discharges, uh, they also high amplitude, which means that uh, many neurons fire together. Um, and um, they last one second or so. Uh, of course, to study mechanism, we need uh, intracell uh, recordings, and they are available in um, uh, experimental models, uh, starting from uh, human brain uh, slices. Uh, in slices, uh, physiologists provoke epilepsy with uh, pro-epileptic solution, so they change balance of excitation and inhibition in favor of uh, excitation. Uh, they observe a similar uh, activity to what we see in, in patient. And uh, in one neuron, uh, we see here two uh, ictal discharges and interictal discharges between. E each interictal discharge is a burst of uh, spikes or action potentials. Um, we do experiments uh, in rats, uh, in um, cortical hippocampal slices, and observe origin of uh, discharges in the anterior cortex. Uh, activity in uh, recorded in, in, in current clump, uh, it is similar to what we have seen uh, in human slices. Um, uh, we, but we, we found more informative uh, mode of recording uh, voltage clump. Uh, if we hold voltage at the level between uh, reversal potentials of uh, GABAergic and glutamatergic um, currents, then uh, we can say that the positive uh, bursts uh, are due to activity of uh, GABA synapses. Mm, negative uh, are due to glutamatergic synapses, glutamatergic uh, dominate in this case. Uh, and first what we do, um, so here again you see two rectal discharges. Uh, first we uh, separate interictal activity on two classes. Uh, IAD1, interictal discharge of type 1, uh, pure positive uh, bursts and uh, positive negative um, 
uh, which we call IID2. And what are mechanisms? Uh, to, to, uh, first, what we've done, uh, we've uh, devised uh, an experimental uh, method of estimation of synaptic conductances. Um, uh, it, it, it involves recording of uh, spontaneous and evoked uh, uh, bursts uh, at different levels uh, of holding voltage and um, pharmacological isolation uh, in case of uh, evoked responses and uh, solving a reverse problem. So the result, result is that uh, during typical uh, IAD1, uh, we observe only single uh, synaptic component which is uh, um, GABA uh, which means that uh, only uh, interneurons are active in fact and they synchronize and they excite each other it is uh, already uh, non-trivial um, and due, during uh, IAD2 we see positive negative uh, component and positive because of GABA as well and negative because of uh, AMPA and NMDA components. Uh, uh, we uh, are also uh, interested in uh, special propagation and here uh, in um, uh, here example of uh, of activity recorded uh, is multiple electrodes in patient and you see the delay and you see uh, limited speed of propagation of ictal wavefront. In contrast, um, pre ictal or interictal discharges are pretty well synchronized or they uh, propagate much faster. And uh, in our preparations with two patch electrodes, we see the delay uh, of the ictal wavefront and uh, the velocity is uh, pretty the same. So it is less than one millimeter per second. Uh, similar uh, velocity is estimated in in vivo with optical imaging and in different uh, slice preparations. Uh, you see dramatic difference uh, of the speed of ictal discharge and interictal discharges, but uh, ictal discharges can accelerate. Um, uh, what are our methods? Uh, we uh, construct complex model and uh, detailed model. A complex model is based on uh, populations, so mean field uh, approach, um, and uh, what is absolutely necessary to describe ictal discharges is uh, ionic dynamics. It is no sense to uh, model ictal discharges without uh, ionic dynamics. And we take uh, uh, formulas from, from previous works. Uh, but uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, to our best knowledge, we don't, we don't know uh, such work, uh, which has all necessary uh, components. Uh, as to a uh, si simple model, it is inspired by a well-known epilepsy uh, model. Um, it is of the, our model is of the same mathematical complexity, but uh, it proposes uh, physical meaning meanings to uh, main variables. Uh, starts from a um, model of a single population. Uh, we use conductance-based refractory density approach. It is a um, particular case of probability density approach uh, where, um, where phase space is uh, one-dimensional and uh, phase variable is the time since the last spike or H and neurons uh, are evolved in this uh, phase space. Uh, and this uh, H parameterizes uh, not only neural density, but uh, membrane potential and gating variables. Um, so this approach uh, allows to use uh, Hodgkin-Huxley approximations, in fact. Uh, and we use it as a black box, so we are uh, no input signals, which are uh, synaptic uh, conductances and uh, estimate uh, output, uh, so it is firing rate. Uh, and the advent main advantage of this model uh, is that uh, it uh, 
uh, it works well uh, with unbalanced uh, in unbalanced states uh, so it predicts oscillations of firing rate uh, in response to uh, rapidly changing uh, input so uh, firing uh, model uh, reproduces uh, well <coughs> PSTH in this case um, uh, of course model uh, in uh, also includes uh, some other formulas for two compartments for um, approximation of synaptic currents uh, synaptic depression how to calculate uh, local field potentials but it is a bit uh, uh, no time boring to describe so let's pass to uh, simulations of empirical discharges first what causes imbalance of uh, excitation and inhibition uh, uh, shift of uh, of the level of chloride inside neurons. So in normal situation, chloride is maintained be, uh, because of uh, co-transporter KCC2. Uh, so it uses a uh, gradient of uh, potassium in order to uh, to maintain low, low concentration of uh, chloride inside cell. Um, and uh, potassium gradient is created by sodium potassium pump. Um, in the case of impaired uh, chloride uh, level, it is uh, due to uh, high uh, potassium um, in extracellular solution or because of uh, a high level of spontaneous activity of uh, interneurons. Um, in this case, uh, chloride, uh, when GABA uh, receptor uh, is open, chloride goes um, yeah, it goes outside cell and uh, depolarizes uh, cell so, so um, this is a pathology and um, we uh, observe in our uh, experimental preparations the shift of um, v gaba of reversal uh, and uh, it, it, to simulate uh, interactal discharges, we need uh, to assume uh, shifted V GABA. Um, in uh, this situation, um, uh, in this situation, interneurons they excite each other by depolarizing uh, GABA receptors, and we observe activity uh, similar to uh, uh, what we see in experiments, uh, positive uh, pulses of uh, current, uh, and only a single GABA uh, synaptic component. Uh, activity, synchronized activity of interneurons is uh, reflected uh, on activity of uh, pyramidal cells and we record this activity. If we uh, shift uh, the GABA more, uh, then uh, interneurons um, are able to excite uh, pyramidal cells and they contribute uh, with a glutamatergic component. So we see GABA glutamatergic component, like in, uh, in a typical experiment. And uh, we have uh, all three synaptic components um, active in this case. And uh, one in, 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 in current clump, we, we see a burst of spikes uh, in experiment and in model. Uh, and what determines timing of these uh, discharges, it is uh, mainly <clears throat> a resource, synaptic resource. So uh, synaptic resource runs out uh, during uh, a single discharge and then it recovers between the discharges. Uh, as to propagation, uh, we model propagation in two-dimensional uh, domain and uh, we observe, uh, first we observe spontaneous Spontaneously originated uh, uh, clusters and then um, uh, waves, and these waves propagate um, with a velocity a few tens of uh, millimeters per second. And IID ID one is slower than IID two, and we compare uh, delays uh, uh, when we record in two uh, sites. Um, with two electrodes in model, <laughs> uh, imaginary electrodes, and uh, compare with what we see in experiments, and it is uh, pretty similar. Uh, 
<clears throat> uh, another third type of uh, interactable discharges is even a simple case when we block GABA activity and block an NDA uh, and we observe only GABA uh, spontaneous discharges. Mm, and um, again, timing is determined by uh, synaptic resource uh, uh, and uh, AHP channels in this case. So these three uh, cases I have already described. Uh, pass, passing to ionic dynamics, we need to um, take into account um, uh, many components of ionic dynamics. Uh, it is uh, uh, voltage uh, gated and uh, leaky channels, it is synaptic channels, uh, it is uh, transporters and glia buffering and, and diffusion with uh, extracellular solution. Um, main uh, ion uh, main ionic concentration is potassium concentration outside. When uh, when it crosses some threshold, then uh, equal discharge occurs, and but, uh, potassium provides positive feedback, so uh, it increases and uh, excitation increases with the potassium. Um, as to um, chloride, uh, it behaves uh, um, in similar way, but uh, without a certain um, threshold. Uh, uh, here is a well-known sketch um, of um, experimental data. Uh, notice that during the discharge, uh, potassium has maximum uh, in the middle, uh, sodium uh, at the end of the discharge. Uh, chloride uh, behaves uh, similar to potassium, but without uh, this minimum between the discharges. So um, we're running a bit short on time, so it would be good to, to wrap it up in about a minute or so. Okay, uh, so, so okay, uh, we, um, we, uh, we modeled the discharges in our complex model, uh, discharges and ionic dynamics and propagation, and a few words about simple model. Uh, our simple model called Epilepto 2, uh, it is composed of four ordinary differential equations uh, and four main variables describe the main processes. It is potassium outside, chloride, uh, sodium inside, uh, depolarization and synaptic resource. And uh, and we, we add a neuron observer to this uh, population model. And we see a pretty well comparison of a model with experiments. So we see a re re repeating this uh, equal discharges. Each, re each discharge is a, a cluster of interictal-like discharges. E each interictal is a burst of spikes. And uh, what is important that main uh, that uh, each equal discharge uh, terminate uh, is terminated by uh, sodium potassium pump. Uh, sodium accumulates uh, during discharge and activates pump, and pump cancels the discharge. That is important, and we. Um, mm, analyzed mathematically uh, our system split to fast subsystem and uh, slow subsystem. Fast subsystem says that uh, interactable discharges are uh, uh, large amplitude stochastic oscillations. Uh, slow subsist subsystem uh, uh, says that uh, timing of equal discharges uh, is determined by oscillations of uh, potassium and sodium discharges. Uh, 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 saying about uh, propagation of the discharges, we found that uh, potassium diffusion uh, is not the, the, the reason of the propagation. It is due to synaptic connectivity instead. And uh, our model uh, uh, reconstruct propagation of ictal discharge, uh, and uh, velocity is pretty well compared with experimental velocity, and uh, interictal discharges are uh, uh, synchronized in this case. So uh, it is obtained with very simple model. Um, uh, conclusions. Uh, Interictal discharges of type 1 and 2 are pure GABAergic and GABAglutamatergic events initiated by interneurons due to depolarizing GABA. Uh, third type IID are pure glutamatergic. Uh, uh, timing is determined by short uh, term um, depression and um, AHP channels.
uh, IID are large uh, amplitude stochastic oscillations. Equal discharges um, in, are initiated by potassium accumulation. accumulation. Uh, each equal discharge is a cluster of IID like events. Uh, accumulation of sodium activates sodium potassium pump, which terminates equal discharge. Special propagation is determined by uh, synaptic con connectivity, not potassium diffusion commonly. Um, um, uh, our CBRD and Epilepto 2 model are useful tools. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you for a uh, very nice talk. Um, we ran out of time for questions, but I think we can do one that uh, received three votes. Uh, it's a question from Scott Rich. And um, the question is, your IDD1 GABA trace has a long time duration. Do you think that it's due to GABA B uh, rather than GABA A signaling? Uh, uh, I, I was talking only about GABA A uh, components. As to GABA B, it can also contribute to, to, to the activity. Uh, you see, for example, uh, a sketch of uh, the mechanism of uh, interictal discharges. And I, uh, I've written here GABA B as uh, one of uh, the mechanisms which can um, determine the timing of the discharge. So, uh, interactive discharge is initiated by depolarizing synaptic currents, and it is uh, cancelled by either synaptic resource or HP like currents or GABA B uh, currents. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, ends this session. So I would like to thank, thank all of much. the speakers. Thank you very much. Of, thank you for your attention. And all of the audience that uh, sat through some of our uh, initial technical uh, difficulties. Thank you, too. And uh, if there's no further urgent business, I'll uh, close the session and press the end broadcast button. Uh, so goodbye, everyone. <laughs>